Hello and welcome. Nehru, The Debates That Defined India is a book that does many things. It actually uh, puts into context uh, some of the issues that keep coming up uh, in the public sphere even today. It gives us a ringside view into the arguments and discussions that kind of shaped many of the early policies of India. And it also puts the spotlight on the man who is so divisive these days, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, a colossus who actually did so much to shape the very idea of India in the early stages, but also someone who has been uh, so strongly criticized. Um, you know, there's no getting away from Nehru and everything that he did wrong these days, but did he really? What was the thinking behind a lot of the arguments he put forth? Well, we have uh, two young scholars, uh, Tripur Daman Singh and Adil Hussain, who join us. Uh, they have co-authored this book. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us, uh, both of you. You know, um, I'm going to cut to the chase and, and come to the conclusion before I come to the actual debate of the discussion, because, you know, the fact is, and I think you put it very well when you say that, you know, Nehru uh, kind of shaped the view or, or the perception or the way people thought for two generations, right? But today, suddenly, pretty much everything he does is, is, is seen in a very negative light. From a hero, he's now in many circles, a villain. I'm gonna start by asking him, what was it in his personality that you think after spending so much of time looking at his uh, works, uh, looking at the arguments he put forth, what do you think was the essence of the man? Uh, I think that he was, um, to start off, he was just a very complicated person. Um, he had, you know, very, there's a very famous quip that Atal Bihari Vajpayee used to recount constantly where, you know, he told Nehru, you have, uh, you're a mixture of Chamberlain and Churchill. And I think uh, that that's actually a very perceptive way of putting it because Nehru was contradictory and complex. Um, and it's very difficult to kind of pin him down uh, to, to just sort of one adjective. And um, that's what makes him such a fascinating figure to study is because he can't really be uh, pinned down so easily um, it makes him very interesting as a figure to to delve into and to study. And I think that's what makes him such a, continues to make him such a controversial figure still. I think from your uh, perspective, you know, what is what has always stood out for me is the, that Nehru was so much a man of his times. He was more clued in to what was happening in the world stage in terms of ideas, thoughts. And he was really disconnected with the more orthodox elements. And that comes out and we will discuss it at length as we go along. But um, it really, the disconnect was so much, you know, um, and maybe he was a minority in the way he was thinking. And, you know, looking back, I do think that most politicians and leaders in uh, the subcontinent have been very inward looking and not really outward looking. Uh, what is your... Uh, what is your thought of this? I mean, I, I, I do agree with the basic assumption that Nehru was like many, um, like many people who brought their countries um, into independence, like many of these post-colonial heroes. He was Western educated, so he understood the West better probably than he understood India. But the interesting thing that fascinates me with Nehru is that he was still open to learn. So when he returns to India after his um, career at Harrow and Cambridge, he comes back and he's open to actually engage with the people and he's open to learn what the political issues are. And then, you know, wherever one, um, however one interprets it, he either gets it completely, he either gets it right or he gets it wrong, but at least he's making an honest attempt in order to understand the complexity that is um, India. He does try, uh, uh, Tripur Dhaban, but you know, he was a man of his times and I think we should delve a little into the backdrop under which he kind of uh, crystallizes ideas and tried to implement this modern vision that he was so adamant in pushing. And a lot of the friction that comes through is in this dilemma of trying to take India into the modern age while he's constantly up against the more uh, orthodox, the, 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 the area that he doesn't quite relate to or want to connect with. Uh, true, and that uh, the the 
the orthodox um, uh, essentially are people who are religious. So religion is is this sort of category that he doesn't uh, uh, doesn't really want to engage with, and he doesn't see as something particularly relevant uh, to the modern age. In fact, he sees it as an impediment to do the sort of greater project of modernity uh, that he's um, that he's sort of leading um, in India. But um, at the same time, Nehru also has a very romanticized idea of the English, of the of the Indian past. So it's not as if Nehru is not is unaware of it or kind of uh, dismisses it entirely, because he traces a sort of historic he traces the historical lineage um, of many of his ideas. For example, secularism to uh, to India's composite past. Um, his writings are uh, um, you know discovery of India, for example, and even the unity of India, for example, are full of these sort of quite. Uh, uh, in some ways, romantic ideas of, of this sort of idyllic past that India had, uh, of what a great civilization it was, of this sort of civilizational continuity from uh, you know from millennia. Uh, so, in in some ways, Nehru himself subscribed to quite uh, a, 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 to a mode of thinking that was associated in in cases with uh, with the orthodox as well. So, again, here he was. Uh, while religion, of course, was anathema to him, uh, the rest of what counted as orthodoxy really wasn't. Of course, his role in the way we see our own history has been phenomenal, because I think the discovery of India has been the kind of source code for a lot of the way history, way history is perceived and taught in India, even today. And uh, there, I think he's a far more universally accepted kind of a figure. Of course, uh, there are strains that have, uh, you know, uh, looked at the other side of it. But let's get into some of the arguments that you talk about. You know, your earlier work, Tripur uh, Daman, was on the 16 stormy days, which is really the 16 days of this debates, hot debates that happened between Shyam Prasad Mukherjee and uh, Nehru on the first amendment of the constitution. But we will get to that. I'm going to start off with the issue of uh, the role of religion and religious orthodoxy in public life, which is the first debate, uh, Adil, uh, between him and Muhammad Iqbal. Uh, 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 you know, they were on two ends of the spectrum, but they were also had mutual respect for each other. Having said that, I think this is a subject where there are two, three pieces that I found very surprising. The first is that Nehru really believed that uh, he was fundamentally against orthodoxy. And he felt that the orthodox elements, both among the Hindus and the Muslims, were keeping, were, were against reform. And, and the Sharda case, which is the child marriage case, is a case in point over here. But what was interesting he, is that he, he saw the orthodoxy as a, an elitist uh, movement, an elitist uh, a kind of uh, leaning. And he said that was going to keep the masses away. Today, on the other hand, we see a complete reversal of this. Uh, you know, it's the masses who are getting more and more orthodox. Is the elite who are more liberal? Uh, did he read it wrong, or do you think that was a time when this was indeed the case? Um, I mean, so so Nehru approaches his analysis of religion in India from a socialist Marxist perspective. And according to Marxist historicism, there are developmental stages through which we can understand societies. And he sees India as being captured by an elite that has entrenched interests. And they're trying to keep the large population of India poor by telling them what Nehru conceives to be um, the opium for the masses, which is religion. So very much like Marx, he sees a specific group of people who are keeping the larger population of India in poverty through religion, and he wants to break that open. So his discontent is not with religion per se, but with the way in which religion has been used in India. And there's a couple of arguments, of course, that he can bring up in order to substantiate his point. The most important argument is, of course, the foundation of the Muslim League that happens um, that is financed by big landowners. So when the Muslim League is really born, it's funded by the princes and princelings and the Aga Khan and all the people who are wealthy. And therefore he says that, well, look, whenever we have religion sort of propping up in India as um, something to engage with politically, it is happening from an elite. And elite, elites have specific interests, and these interests are then playing out in politics. So therefore, Nehru is very reluctant to adopt the idea that religion, by and large, 
um, is something that drives the Indian population. And of course, he gets this wrong because the birth of Pakistan is the biggest condemnation of his theory that the masses in large are only interested in poverty alleviation and they don't care about religion at all. And it's kind of surprising that he gets that wrong because at the end of the day, 1857, which is not that far away from the time that Nehru is living, it's a mere, I mean, even um, from independence, it's only 90 years away. Um, but that also had a deep religious um, coloring. So that Nehru thinks that in 90 years, the Indian population has suddenly moved away and is now concerned with very different things shows the specific modernist sort of stance that he has towards politics, where he thinks that the middle of the 20th century is really the most enlightened period of history. And that now with these new modern tools, he can bring India into the um, glorious, into a glorious age of um, um, development. Um, and yes, he gets it, he gets it wrong. Religion was just as popular um, back then, maybe even more popular than it is today. And it was also used in order to um, bring people into the political realm, as we saw with the Muslim League and the foundation of Pakistan in 1947. There is, of course, the direct trigger for this uh, debate between uh, Muhammad Iqbal and Jawaharlal Nehru was on the question of the Ahmadiyas, a sect uh, that uh, Mm, uh, Iqbal believed was uh, not really Islamic. It wasn't something that, uh, you know, should be encouraged. Uh, of course, you draw a parallel, which has been criticized by some of the reviewers, of what has happened to the Ahmadiyyas today in Pakistan. Uh, how do you see the connection? How do you see the way the, the perception on the Ahmadiyyas has uh, kind of evolved, Adi? Um, so let's, let's just... Um briefly sort of summarize the argument for the for the for the viewers so, the, so they know um what is happening so iqbal is proposing um some type of state structure in which um religion should be the binding glue for a nation um and here he's sort of looking at the failure of nation states in europe where people have used language they've used culture, they've used ethnicity, they've used territory in order to birth the idea of a nation and sort of foster um, or substantiate the nation state. So Iqbal is looking at that and he's saying that we are going to use something that is um, not any of these categories, but we are going to use something that is metaphysical, spiritual, we're going to use religion. Now, when you use religion in order to bind a nation together, attacks that happen on the spiritual frontier, for instance, somebody claiming that they are prophet or somebody claiming that they want to reform Islam in a specific manner, are a threat to the very idea of the nation, because the nation, as you've envisioned it, can now easily splinter. And Iqbal wanted to have like a big inclusive umbrella through which he wanted to unite Muslims, but at the same time, he had to draw a line somewhere. And he draws the line um, precisely um, around the belief system of this Muslim reformist sect that is born in North India in the 19th century. And he says that these people believe that the Messiah has come, and they believe in a form of Islam that allows for revelation to continue. And because it allows for revelation to continue, it can always empty out the core of Islam, which bases itself on the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, on his teachings. And therefore, they are an imminent threat to the future Muslim polity that he is envisioning. Now, one could sort of, you know, draw continuities to the present and say that, well, Pakistan more came more closely to Iqbal's vision with the specific constitutional transformations that happened. Um, in the 70s through Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, and it became more how Iqbal wanted it to become. The interesting thing about Iqbal is also that he wants a constitutional exclusion. So he's not asking for some a religious body to sort of come together and um, say that Ahmadis are no longer part of this Muslim body, but he's saying that it should happen in parliament and it should happen through constitutional reforms. So really one could make this sort of easy connection and say that, well, what happens then with the constitutional exclusion of Ahmadis in 1974 is really foreshadowed with what Iqbal presents. Um, what I found most interesting about the debate that he's having with Nehru is that both men have been very coy to speak about religion 
um, at all. So they're not theologians, neither is, uh, is Iqbal nor Nehru. But here they come together and discuss these very sort of difficult theological concepts um, in order to arrive at some form of exclusion of how a state can intervene in religion through exclusion, which is the very juicy and interesting bit about this debate that these two men are having. It's interesting over here how, to, how the orthodox elements of both uh, uh, the Muslim orthodoxy and Hindu orthodoxy came out uh, against the reforms that were being, uh, and there was a lot of uh, solidarity in, in putting reforms away. And I think looking back, it is unimaginable that somebody would kind of, um, you know, be against an act like the Sharda Act, which you know, was so important, but, uh, you know, those are different times. Uh, an extension of that debate is the debate with Jinnah. What stood out for me, uh, and this was about representation, this was before the provincial elections, it was a back and forth. What stood out for me were two, three things. First is that, uh, you know, Nehru's constantly uh, at Jinnah. Jinnah is forever ignoring what he's trying to say and not wanting to get into the debate, though in the public they are sparring over this issue. So it, it brings out a, a different personality of it. And I, I think it was, uh, you've quoted Mahatma Gandhi as saying that, uh, you know, you just can't win an argument with Nehru. I mean, that's one of the things about him. The second is that in the provincial uh, elections, of course, this is about representation um, uh, Jinnah and the Muslim League want separate, uh, you know, uh, seats for Muslims. Nehru's vehemently against it. And yet when they go out for elections, none of them make a mark in the Muslim vote bank, you know? And that I think was very, very stark. Well, these debates, were they just happening in closed doors or were they relating to the people? And how did this election and this debate shape things to come? Because we get more virulent about communal issues post these provincial election when there is a stronger thrust towards, uh, towards the divisiveness there. Um, so I think the world has, there's quite a few points to unpack there. Um, so I'll start from the election itself. Uh, you're right that it doesn't, well, the Muslim League, um, you know, doesn't do all that well um, in the election. But uh, what, what does happen, and especially UP is, is a test case, is that they also find it impossible to work together because the Provincial Muslim League uh, is, uh, you know, wants a coalition with the Congress. Um, everything's sort of fixed up by uh, Azad. And then the whole scheme is torpedoed by Nehru. So, um, uh, you know, that's that's uh, after which the Congress begins what it calls the, um, I think it's it, it, a sort of mass outreach program towards Muslims for which they piggyback uh, on the Jamaat. And um, it, of course, we we can you know now look back and say, well, you know, the, the program was a complete failure. Uh, but for at that point in time, with the Congress having just you know won the election, uh, excluded the Muslim League, it also constituted in a way a sort of existential threat um, uh, for you know for the League itself, and you know perhaps also for uh, for Jinnah. So you know that's one thing um, really to bear in mind when we uh, you know when when we look at this period and this uh, and this sort of correspondence. Equally, it's not, um, it's not in, it, this debate isn't really happening behind closed doors. It, you know, as we write in the introduction, these are very much, uh, uh, you know, while they're sort of cerebral, uh, you know, exchanges, they're also very much um, a way of kind of marking out territory pos and positioning yourself in the, uh, in the public sphere. So, you know, once they have this debate, they release their correspondence to the public as a way of, uh, uh, you know, of positioning themselves uh, in the argument, which is also happening, um, you know, in the sort of wider, uh, wider public sphere. Right. Uh, I think how is, uh, of course, over here in India, Nehru's become extremely divisive. Uh, got a cult following or he's got everybody criticizing him. I mean, you know, there's no denying the fact that he was one of the greatest shapers of modern India as we see it. How is he perceived in Pakistan? Mm, uh, he, Nehru, like in India, he's perceived differently by different people. Um, part of it, I do think people still blame him for um, partition. Um, so the main um, antagonism that is still leveled against Nehru, especially by an older generation, um, is that um, he was um, at the levers of power when it came to the crucial um, days leading up to the separation and the birth of the two nation states, and he was the one who could have prevented it. 
um, because Jinnah may, makes the argument and says that um, what he and many of the Muslims are afraid of is that in a democracy, they will always be eternally in a minority and their rights cannot be protected. So the Muslim demand has always been a constitutional demand for safeguards. And Nehru's position has always been that, okay, but um, the real problem isn't really between Hindus and Muslims, but the real problem is between poor people and people who have entrenched interests and money. And because of this sort of fundamental misunderstanding, when uh, it comes to the crucial sort of um, um, the crucial constitutional moment where they're trying to sort of um, come to an agreement, Nehru is not willing to sacrifice his position and allow Muslims to have safeguards, um, even when these come with specific weightages. So despite the numerical number of Muslims, they get a sort of specific more rights or stronger representation. And Nehru says that this cannot be, this cannot be um, possible. So I do think many people in Pakistan still see him as the sort of prime reason that partition happened and um, all of the violence that sort of followed that moment. And if you're responsible for, or if people perceive you as being responsible for that um, type of violence, then of course your public perception won't really be good. <laughs> they seem to be a minority in India also, Tripur uh, Daman, because that's, just, that's the pity of it. Because, you know, if you go to the fundamental point that uh, Jawaharlal Nehru was making, it was at, in a country facing the problems that we did when we were uh, marching towards freedom, it was, it was really, uh, you know, um, important to look ahead, to look at development, to look at the economy, to look at progress not to look at uh, divisiveness uh, on the basis of, you know, religion. And now it's become on caste, on creed, on a whole lot of other things. Uh, you know, it, there were two strains in India. And I, I always believe that there's a difference between a, 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 a universe that embraced this liberal uh, attitude and moved ahead. And that India that was against this and stayed behind, you know, in the sense it's still in the morass of, of communal uh, conversations. Uh, how do you kind of, as a historian, again, as a researcher, how do you balance this out when you assess Nehru? Again, I mean, it's, we try and avoid taking a normative position on this because uh, once you take a normative position, you know, it's very hard to, uh, to then sort of back down and, you know, either condemn Nehru or uh, you know, big him up and place him on a pedestal, which is what uh, not taking a normative position would involve. But the, the nationalist movement itself, as you say, there were two strands on, and there was one strand, uh, I would say that this sort of, the Nehruvian strand was always um, always in a minority, which is why you see that it never really, uh, Nehruvianism never really rises uh, until um, after independence, until after Nehru has executive power. Uh, so there's a, you, you see that even with the recent controversy over Bose, where people have, I, I've seen people quote on Twitter Bose's letter uh, to his brother saying, you know, nobody has, uh, uh, you know, has damaged him as badly as Nehru, because Bose very much believed that as a, as a, as a fellow member of the radical wing and as a socialist, uh, you know, Nehru would very much back him in his kind of standoff with, uh, with the Congress right. But actually Nehru doesn't do it because, uh, uh, Nehru is very good at managing uh, his relationship with both sides. So um, it, I think it's it's not completely true to say that uh, that there were these two sides. These two sides really emerged uh, after Nehru um, gained executive power, because during the sort of nationalist phase, during the struggle for independence, it was very easy to generate a uh, kind of unity or solidarity because um, and there was the overarching issue of, well, we need to get rid of colonialism. But within that body, um, Indian nationalism had, uh, you know, sociologically uh, sort of rested uh, on, on religion and caste itself, mobilization. And this is, again, going back to the argument with Iqbal, uh, that uh, the only thing providing this sort of solidarity, and thus the only real axis of political mobilization uh, was um, caste or religion. So whether they're Tilak's, you know, Ganpati festivals or whether uh, it's, uh, 
uh, it's this sort of imagery oh, of, Ram of Ram Raja, right? Mahatma Gandhi's, you know, evocation of Ram Raja, or the sort of, um, you know, uh, the evocation of Bharat Mata. Uh, all of these things were were tinged with religiosity. So it could be argued, and many people do, that this was the sort of real axis of mobilization, and this was on what uh, this was sociologically the kind of uh, base for uh, for Indian nationalism on which. A more sort of uh, a kind of liberal, secular sort of uh, you know kind of elite was uh, was writing. Right, Mini. If I if I may just add to that, um, so if we so if we go back to the letters that Nehru exchanged with Jinnah, you can also see from Jinnah's attitude that he's not very much willing to openly sort of have a discussion with Nehru because he sees him as a minor figure within the Congress party. So part yes. of the reason that he's so cold in the, in the late thirties, apart from you know, Nehru's um, constantly pushing him to articulate his position so he can go forward and sort of be the arbitrator and sort of see um, how he can accommodate it is that Nehru doesn't uh, that Jinnah doesn't see Nehru as the key figure within the Congress Party. So it's only with Nehru acquiring executive power after partition and becoming prime minister that he arrives at the position that he is. Um, earlier on, he's very much carried on by Gandhi. So it's very much on the shoulders of Gandhi that he writes to 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 the positions of powers that he eventually finds himself in, and it's only after the death of both Badil and Gandhi that he becomes the sort of only national um, figure to which almost no opposition is is possible for at least a, a couple of years. So it's important to sort of not forget that that Nehru's popularity at its peak wasn't really his popularity in the 30s. That's an interesting point. That's an interesting perspective. Uh, but uh, uh, let me come to the, the argument and debate on the First Amendment. I mean, your, your uh, previous book, The 16 Stormy Days, kind of delved into the 16 Stormy Days where these were discussed. Uh, it was a face-off between Shah Prasad Mukherjee and Nehru. Uh, take us through the highlights because that gives a very different perception. I wouldn't think a liberal uh, you know, um, uh, person, a leader of, of the world would uh, have such a strident view. It was ironical that the, the conservative orthodox element was seen as the liberal, while the liberal uh, uh, leader was seen as somebody who was trying to get the executive to have, to grab power, so to say, you know. So how, how, how do you read this debate? I mean, since you've done so much of work on it. Um. So just again, just uh, just to give a quick rundown of the issues involved, uh, the government had been stymied uh, with zamindari abolition, which had been held up by the courts um, due to the right to property, even though uh, technically all of the laws had eventually uh, passed muster. The idea was that this you know, big social revolution that Nehru had planned uh, and which you know, all of the Congress was behind um, was, was being held up. Uh, essentially delayed. Um, the second was the question of community-based reservations, uh, which again the courts had struck down as violating the right to freedom from discrimination, and this again had been a, a, a sort of part and parcel of the Congress idea of a social revolution, um, which was to challenge sort of entrenched inequalities um, uh, of, of caste. And uh, crucially, this was not reservation for scheduled class on which you know, there had been consensus and which were enshrined in the constitution, but reservations for, uh, as they called, backward classes um, beyond that. And then the third issue, of course, and possibly the most emotive was uh, freedom of speech, because Nehru really believed that um, uh, uh, a lot of the criticism that was being directed at him was essentially trying to uh, generate public pressure to either for him to have military action against Pakistan or to generate um, uh, a sort of class or communal tension uh, within India. And you see that with the case of Crossroads, which was supporting the communist rebellion and criticizing Nehru for the harsh measures that the Indian government was taking. So the First Amendment basically, you know, gave all of these powers, uh, you know, it wrote roughshod over the right to property, um, uh, drastically curtailed freedom of speech, uh, enabled caste-based reservations um, by, uh, again, by, uh, you know, hemming in the right to freedom from discrimination. And so it kicked off this, this huge debate. Now, 
Nehru says many things, uh, as you say in, in this debate, which don't really fit the popular narrative of, of him being uh, uh, this sort of liberal genteel figure. And that's because he really wasn't. Um, as Adil has mentioned, for Nehru, the big question uh, was the question of poverty. And the sort of big answer to that question was socialism. So for him, and he said this very openly, uh, both during the debate and during the time the constitution was being framed, that uh, this constitution was a tool of social uh, trans social and economic transformation. For him, you know, as he used to say, it was, uh, you know, the purpose of the constitution is to uh, feed the starving millions and clothe the naked masses. So for him, that, uh, that sort of trumped uh, everything else. And the social revolution that he was in, uh, uh, you know, that he was leading really trumped the kind of uh, this sort of commitment to uh, to classical liberalism or constitutionalism as it was posited, because he keeps framing it as saying, you know, these are old ideas, these are old ideas drawn from the French Revolution, uh, they're no longer relevant. Uh, and so he is, uh, he's very much, as one might say, a, a sort of communitarian in, um, in those terms. Mukherjee is an even more interesting figure. It's actually surprising that not that many people latch on to. Uh, it's, e it's, easy, he's e it's easy to portray him as this sort of conservative element. Uh, but, uh, you know, someone batting for freedom of speech in India is never really a conservative, because since there's no real tradition of free speech, uh, I mean, there's no real organic liberal tradition, uh, anybody who articulates that position is, uh, in my eyes, sort of, you know, ipso facto, uh, uh, a radical and Mukherjee was not only doing it in parliament, he was also chairperson of the All India Civil Liberties Conference. So he was, uh, you know, he'd very much sort of staked his reputation uh, uh, on that. And it, that I think makes this uh, even more fascinating to, to look at. The, his arguments are, uh, are drawn from sort of, you know, very classical liberalism. Of the, he would not be out of place in the uh, in the Whig Party in the 1800s. Um, I think one could argue that, uh, you know, that the change in, in the tone was also because Nehru was impatient. There were serious issues that the economy faced. Uh, the 50s and 60s were very, very uh, debilitating from the eco economic standpoint. And he, with, with responsibility that came with power, he was adamant to push it through. Uh, what would you say to that argument based on what the debate has been. He was, and if we see, if we take like the greater picture, there were um, a number of countries that had acquired independence um, in the mid 20th century. After colonialism's withdrawal, many of these countries had acquired um, statehood and they all came with their own constitutions. So if we compare India to those countries, Nehru actually fares fairly well because many of the post-colonial heroes as they were known at the time went full on authoritarian and they declared dictatorships and they got rid of their constitutions within a number of years. And we see that on the, um, in Pakistan, of course, um, but also in many countries in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, so for Nehru to not live up to liberal constitutionalism in its classical forms could be just that he wasn't really trying to exercise power. So it's always um, easier to, um, to give a promise of, um, um, to give a promise to uphold the constitution when you're not the person who has executive power and is actually um, in, a, in a way curtailed by the constitutional text. So once Nehru changes that position, he realizes that in order to do some of the big transformations that he wants to do, as Tripudaman just um, outlined, that is the way forward. Like the way forward would be to also leave the constitution in specific fields in order to implement the vision that he has for India. Now we can of course say that that doesn't make him a liberal in the sort of classic sense because he's sort of betraying his own ideas or we could be with Nehru and say that well, it wasn't as bad as it was in other countries. But of course, the well, argument well, on the other side- It was a reaction to the times that he was living in and the challenges that we faced at that particular point. Yes. And, and you know, it's amazing that even though uh, Tripur Daman, uh, he, he's been criticized for, for that, uh, for pushing through the amendment, First Amendment, look at how politics since then has shaped up. It's all been around those themes of reservation, of of uh, protecting uh, a few, et cetera. So in many senses, I mean, it's been worse off, hasn't it, since then? 
Uh, I mean, again, there are two ways of looking at looking at this. So one is, of course, uh, you know, take the idea that there is a sense of path dependency. Uh, so, you know, Nehru, what he was doing was not merely, uh, and, and again, I point this out in some places, the sort of Westminster tradition which Nehru inhabited very much rested on precedent conventions, traditions, which India really didn't have. So, you know, his Nehru's role uh, was also to create uh, a sort of instant convention or instant precedent. So what Nehru was doing was not merely the specific acts that he was doing, he was also shaping the role of prime minister and the sort of expectations of government uh, and laying down precedents as to how business was to be conducted. Uh, so in that sense, it's unsurprising that uh, things have continued down that vein. It's, uh, you know, it's what one would expect. But on the other hand, given how people, how much of an emotive issue this is, uh, one would have thought that a repudiation of India's Nehruvian legacy, as uh, as is supposedly underway now, would also involve repudiation of these facts. But uh, it doesn't. So I guess that tells you a lot about uh, uh, where India stands and what constitutes a sort of consensus in Indian politics. Right. Let's come to the last issue that uh, the last debate, uh, which is between Sardar Patel and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. It's done in the 1950s when the Tibetan issue is at the forefront. And uh, that is where uh, the, the problems arise from my point of view. Also, as, as you look at what happened in that decade leading up 1964 uh, and his death, uh, the fact that he got China so wrong, you know, and uh, I think Patel was far more with it when he was noticing what is happening on the ground. Uh, does it come through that, you know, Jawaharlal Nehru perhaps was not monitoring what was happening on, a, on the ground and he was really looking at a larger picture of the, this whole vision of Asia and these two great civilizations coming together? Did he get it completely wrong, Adi? Um, so, first of all, I do think it's important to just see the entire debate through Chinese eyes. So for the Chinese, for especially the 19th century, which they call the century of humiliation, because that's where they lose the opium wars against the British. That's where they have to sign the Treaty of Nanking in 1854 that allows the British to have like all of these outposts in Hong Kong and a little bit of Shanghai in the international settlement. Um, many of the people that the Chinese are fighting against are Indian. So they're Indian recruits in the British East India Company. So for the Chinese, India has always looked like a threat and it has looked like a tool that imperialism is using to expand into the Asian continent. So when Nehru is coming up in the mid 20th century with the promises of a type of internationalism where all the poor countries of the world can unite against the rich countries and where he can portray a specific form of um, sort of Asian internationalism where India is leading all the other countries um, into a sort of more glorious future on the um, on the international stage, then for China, that looked like a continuation of imperialism because they already felt that Indians had sort of occupied them and that Indians had, um, you know, both in Shanghai and in Hong Kong, um, created businesses that exploited Chinese workers. Mm -hmm. So for the Chinese and the newly sort of, um, for the new Chinese government that came into place after Mao, um, Nehru looked very British. And that wasn't really good. But Nehru for himself thought that this is like a new relationship that he can foster in order to produce a new um, internationalism where Asian countries can sort of unite. And that is what Nehru's, how Nehru sort of in, in a big way sort of misreads the situation. And Badil, the sort of more hard-nosed realist who understands that sovereignty and nation states um, are, is particularly important, something that we see playing out in a sort of very violent form through the annexation of princely states within India. And then, you know, on the outside, where for him borders are paramount and important and need to be protected. And um, the only real thing that matters is the nation state. So when Badil, um, Badil's position that of course sort of rubs against um, Nehru's um, internationalism, and it's really what we see playing out in that debate. How do you read it, Tukur Daman? Because, um, you know, one can argue that, uh, you know, um, there was 
this side of uh, Nehru, which was this idealist, you know, where, where he had this vision of what it was that he was disconnected with reality. We, we saw that when you talk about the role of religion in everyday life and over here with this, uh, this, this strong bond that he felt he had with China, which nothing that happened through the 50s or 60s kind of, uh, you know, um, justified. Um, I mean, I, again, I, I don't really think there's, uh, that's idealism. It, this position was born out of uh, uh, Nehru's belief that, you know, socialism meant peace uh, and socialism by its, since, you know, war only came either through capitalism or imperialism, both of which, you know, uh, were kind of intertwined and uh, socialism by itself meant peace and um, by itself since uh, again, the big question was economics and not uh, nationality or sovereignty or religion or, uh, you know, ethnicity. Uh, it could, uh, it was also something that was easily translated onto the international sphere. So for him, this boundary, you know, between the national and the international uh, didn't exist, which is why he thought, um, you know, this would be quite, quite, quite an easy uh, sort of thing to do. Uh, secondly, he himself, uh, because he had this uh, you know, stature of a global statesman, um, and he believed it was India's kind of manifest destiny, maybe his manifest destiny to really lead, uh, because India achieved independence, you know, before uh, the end of the Chinese Civil War, you know, before, uh, so he, he really believed he was going to uh, lead the, as he called them, smaller brothers towards, um, uh, towards this sort of, you know, great socialist dawn. And so for him, these are very, given his own ideas, these are very realist positions to take. Uh, it wasn't born purely out of idealism because idealism is to believe like in a sort of ideal. He very much believed that this was possible. In fact, the more they criticized him, uh, because the more, uh, you know, the Chinese called him a hireling of Anglo-American imperialism, for example, uh, the more he bent over to, uh, to, to repudiate, to, you know, to, avoid giving that impression. So the more concessions he was willing to give, he was not ignorant um, of, uh, of what was going on because on occasion he would say, he, uh, uh, you know, he was getting information, the same information that was going to Patel and others. Uh, so it, it's not as if he was ignorant about what was going on. He did acknowledge that at some point, uh, you know, borders might you know, need to be defended uh, and uh, he also came up with, uh, he was uh, one of the brains behind the forward po policy, which, uh, sure. you know, eventually, eventually led to war. So it wasn't as if he was ignorant. Uh, and of course, there were also material considerations because India was a poor third world country, which didn't really have the economic or the military resources to really mount uh, any sort of uh, real military um, offensives. So for Nehru, this partly this idea of socialist internationalism or you know giving concessions to china to kind of placate it or to really use his own stature uh, as as a sort of diplomatic tool was also sometimes instrumental it was meant to kind of cover uh, paper over the the harsh reality which is that india was a poor third world country with very limited military resources um, this is really a very quick summation of the four arguments and the debates that you uh, brought through with uh, with your uh, uh, great research into into the into the actual back and forth uh, between these leaders. But uh, and each of this deserves a, a show on its own because it, it's so nuanced and it's so complex. But I am going to end with a quote uh, that you have picked up from uh, B. R. Nanda's book. Uh, he was, of course, the Nehru's biographer. Who and and it goes. To the conservative, he was an extremist. To the Marxist, a renegade. To the Gandhian, a non-Gandhian. To big business, a dangerous radical. So he kind of rubbed everybody the wrong way and everybody thought he was on the other side. And yet there is this larger than life persona of this man. You know, it's so difficult to kind of pin him down to a definition, to a notion, to an idea. You either like what he stood for or or you criticize it. And that's what it's come down to. It's so polarized, right? Nobody lo looks at the nuances that there could be shades of gray. They, you know, and everything that he did and what he did wrong was also a product of the times that he lived in. You can only, you know, uh, base decisions on what you have at that moment. You, you don't have the, 
the privilege of hindsight, so to say, right? So in a nutshell, what is your takeaway on Nehru? What is the one thing that you learned about him that uh, after all these years of research still kind of uh, stumps you? Adi? I mean, the one thing that I find really impressive is that um, despite um, being um, out of the political picture for so long, he still manages to ignite all of the key debates. So either when we're looking in India or we're looking in Pakistan, um, the debates that he engaged in sometimes uh, 100 years ago are still the ones that we're trying to find um, good answers to. And that just shows you that um, whatever else he was, he was um, very perceptive of the political moment and could also, and had the ability to sort of foreshadow it and in a way futurize it. What about you? Uh, I th I'd agree with Adil. And I just add actually one of the more surprising things to me, and this comes out very strongly in the debate with Iqbal, um, is actually Nehru's willingness to engage with his contemporaries and, and uh, 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 you know, colleagues, opponents, critics, uh, the idea that there is something to learn or that this sort of very rational engagement uh, maybe you know could uh, uh, could lead to a solution, and I think there's something there's something to be admired um, in that because uh, you just look at the debate with Iqbal, right? He's uh, he doesn't even have too much of a local standa in the matter. He's in jail in uh, you know in Almora, but he still chooses to engage in this conversation uh, as a way of uh, both you know learning something and perhaps uh, being able to find some sort of common working ground with uh, someone who's. Uh, you know, not uh, not really uh, his his colleague or friend, and I think that you know that to me was both surprising and I, you know I think something something admirable. And there's a poignant uh, anecdote about how he goes and visits Iqbal when Iqbal is ailing in Lahore, and how he sits on the floor and listens to him, and you know doesn't uh, doesn't argue for a change. But for me, he's really a man who uh, may be divisive, but what a man who actually set some of the you know I think he set India on a path of of with confidence. And I think he set up institutions which were world-class and he nowhere believed that uh, because India was a third world country that we had to be lesser than anybody. And I think that confidence came from his own intellectual confidence and the fact that he could stand his ground no matter what. Well, uh, these debates will continue. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and reigniting the debates around uh, the topics that have gone so far in defining the way we are, the way we look at history, and the way we look at this particular leader uh, who is so larger than life even today. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for having us, Mini. Thanks. Thanks.